Hello, back to Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10, verse 21. This is New Testament video 192, Luke lesson 35. Luke chapter 10, Luke 10. We should finish the chapter in this lesson. Heavenly Father, thank you for another day of grace. Thank you for the opportunity to teach. May this edify, encourage, and enlighten us in Christ's name. Amen. Luke 10, verse 21. In that hour, Jesus rejoiced in spirit and said, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent, and hast revealed them unto babes. Even so, Father, for so it seemed good in thy sight. All things are delivered to me of my Father, and no man knoweth who the Son is, but the Father, and who the Father is, but the Son, and he to whom the Son will reveal him. To Matthew. This is similar to Matthew. Matthew chapter 11. Matthew 11. You will recall from our prior lesson that Luke 10 reads quite similar to Matthew 11. Well, here's another instance of that. See, earlier, Luke 10, we saw Chorazin, Bethsaida, Capernaum condemned, upbraided. Well, that was Matthew 11. Now, here we are, back in Luke 10 and Matthew 11. Matthew 11, verse 25. Matthew 11, 25. At that time, Jesus answered and said, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent, and hast revealed them unto babes. Even so, Father, for so it seemed good in thy sight. All things are delivered unto me of my Father, and no man knoweth the Son, but the Father. Neither knoweth any man the Father, save the Son, and he to whomsoever the Son will reveal him. Back to Luke 10. You can put a marker in Matthew 11. Luke 10. Luke 10, verse 21. Here is appropriate rejoicing. Earlier, Luke 10, verse 17, the 70 not 72, the 70 returned again with joy, verse 17, saying, Lord, even the devils are subject unto us through thy name. Verse 20, the Lord corrected them, notwithstanding in this, verse 20, notwithstanding in this rejoice not, that the spirits are subject unto you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. They're among the list of saints. They're on the list of saints in the Messianic Church. Israel's believing remnant. They're waiting for the days of heaven on earth. Deuteronomy 11. Don't rejoice. We have power over Satan. Don't rejoice because of that. We can cast out devils. We have authority over the evil spirits, the unclean spirits. No, rather, rejoice because your names are written in heaven. They were proud. There. Don't be proud. Don't be prideful like Satan was.
like Lucifer was when he transformed into Satan. Here is appropriate rejoicing. Again, Luke 10, 21, In that hour Jesus rejoiced in spirit. He's thinking like the Father. And said, I thank thee, O Father. He's talking to his heavenly Father. Lord of heaven and earth, that thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent, and hast revealed them unto babes. Even so, Father, for so it seemed good in thy sight. All things are delivered to me of my Father, and no man knoweth who the Son is but the Father, and who the Father is but the Son, and he to whom the Son will reveal him. See, the intimacy there, the communion between Father and Son. The communion between these two members of the Godhead. And of course, the Holy Spirit is there too. The Holy Ghost, His name. Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Christ Jesus, the Son, He is the spokesman of the Godhead. The Father and the Holy Ghost, they reveal themselves through the Son speaking. In Christ dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Colossians 2.9 In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. John 1 verse 1 The Communicator Jesus is the spokesman, the speaker for the Trinity, the Godhead. The three members of the Godhead are represented by the Son there manifesting all three. Father, how thankful am I. You've hidden these things. Thou hast hid these things from the wise and the prudent, and hast revealed them unto babes. Jews who will humble themselves and come to you through me. Put aside their philosophy. Put aside their vain speculations, their rabbinical interpretations, their oral tradition, rabbinical scholarship. You've hidden spiritual truth from apostate Israel, proud Israel, goody-goody Israel, self-righteous Israel, but you've revealed spiritual truths to babes. Humble, 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 humble. Humble yourself as this little child, Matthew 18. Israel is proud. Lost Israel is proud. Hmm. That's the chief sin in hell, is pride. I did it my way. I didn't follow you, Lord. I didn't believe on your son. I didn't submit to the righteousness of God in Christ. I did it my own way. The wise and the prudent. The wise and the prudent. In this evil world system, Sinners are going about doing what they want to do, regardless of what the Creator desires of me, wills for me. I am my own God. Following Lucifer, Satan, in his rebellion. 
Lord of heaven and earth, you've hid these things from the wise and the prudent. They are filled with the wisdom of this world. 1 Corinthians chapters 1, 2, and 3. 1 Corinthians chapters 1, 2, and 3. That's what God thinks about the scholarship of the world system in which we find ourselves. Not flattering at all. 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians 1. When we were in Matthew 11, I read to you 1 Corinthians chapters 1, 2, and 3. And I will not do that here for sake of brevity, because we have a lot to cover in Luke 10. 1 Corinthians. Read 1 Corinthians chapters 1, 2, and 3. 1 Corinthians 1, 2, and 3. Listen. 1 Corinthians 1. Verse 17, For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved it is the power of God. For it is written, Isaiah 29, 14, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent, where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For after that in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that he's chosen before the foundation of the world? Uh-uh. No. No. That's how Calvinists would read the verse wearing his denominational eyeglasses. No, 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 no. The Pure Bible says, It pleased God, 1 Corinthians 1, 21, It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. Oh, believe. See, that's not something God did. That's something a person did. We're exalting the will of man above the will of God. No, God's chosen to save them that believe. It is God's will. That that's how they're saved. They're pa they're, they, they pass from death to life by believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. Doing is not in the sense here of what can I do in the flesh to please God, but rather it's what can we do without doing anything. Well, the only thing we can do without doing anything is believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. That He did enough at Calvary. For the Jews, 1 Corinthians 1.22, For the Jews require a sign. And the Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified. Unto the Jews a stumbling block, and unto the Greeks foolishness. See the Greeks there? Intellectuals. Philosophers. Acts 17. And yet Romans 1 they profess themselves to be wise, they became fools because they don't have God's Word. They have their pagan idols. 1 Corinthians 1, verse 24. But unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God, because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For ye see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble, are called. But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. And base things of the world, the common things, the lowly things. And things which are despised hath God chosen. Yea, and things which are not to bring to naught things that are. That no flesh should glory in His presence. My people, they don't have to have a dozen seminary and college degrees to do the work of the ministry. They don't have to read a hundred prayer books 
and theology books and confessionals and creeds to do the work of my ministry. I've chosen those people to be my servants who in the eyes of the world are nothing. Nobodies. That's who I choose to do my ministry. Why? That no flesh should glory in his presence? Look what I did. I am so educated. I am so wise in the world. God says, none of that is a prerequisite to do my work. No boasting. No boasting. Mm -mm. 1 Corinthians 1.30, But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, that according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. Not glory in self, glory in the Lord. Because in the Lord, Christ Jesus is our wisdom, our righteousness, our sanctification, our redemption. And you know what? Not all the seminaries and colleges and universities and Bible colleges around the world combined will give you that. The position that the believer has in Christ can't be found in any school, anywhere, any time around the world. Mm -mm. Oh. Intelligentsia and academia. Oh. We're insulted. You mean that my college degrees and my university can or mean nothing? Well, when it comes to perceiving and understanding and communicating the things of God, yes. Mm -hmm. I'm not against education. I have advanced secular degrees, but you know what? I don't seek spiritual truth using them. Because there are people who are even more degreed than me, who struggle to comprehend even simple Bible truths. It has nothing to do with they, they need more education. No, what they need is the Holy Spirit. And I rely on the Holy Spirit, not secular degrees. Diplomas, papers on the wall, to understand and enjoy the Bible. 1 Corinthians 2. And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. Paul, the Apostle Paul, was an educated man. We study his ministry in Acts, as well as Romans through Philemon, his epistles. Paul was educated in the world. He was a lost man at one time, prior to ministry, prior to Acts 9. He was an educated man, and yet, when it came to understanding Bible truth, ignoramus. For I determined, 1 Corinthians 2.2, 2, for I determined to know for I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but a demonstration of the Spirit and of power, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of man, but in the power of God. Mm -hmm. And yet, all too often, that's what professing believers are relying on. It's not the power of God, but the wisdom of men. They believe their professors, they believe their preachers, they believe their priests, their bishops, their popes, church councils, patristic writings, confessionals, creeds. Mm. And all of that doesn't have the power of God. Mm. So, it's a faulty foundation. And sooner or later, it will crumble. And so will whatever spiritual life they have. That's why Paul is warning the Corinthians here, don't base your Christian life, 
your experience in the wisdom of men, on the wisdom of men, because it will poof, collapse. Stand rather in the power of God. Where is the power of God? It's in the word of God, rightly divided. And Paul is warning them, the Corinthians, stuck on pagan, idolatrous doctrine here. False teaching. Greek philosophy. He's warning them, 1 Corinthians 2, 6, How be it? We speak wisdom among them that are perfect, spiritually mature, yet not the wisdom of this world, nor the princes of this world that come to naught. But we speak the wisdom of God, God's wisdom, not the world's wisdom, not the wisdom of the princes of this world, not satanic wisdom, not satanic ingenuity. Satan is wise, but he's just a creature. He's not the creator. Remember our last study? We speak the wisdom of God in a mystery. 1 Corinthians 2.7 Even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory, which none of the princes of this world knew, for had they known it, they would, have not they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, I have not seen scientific method, nor ear heard tradition, neither have entered into the heart of man intuition, the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. How do we grasp the things that God has prepared that God has prepared for them that love him? Do we use science? No, nope. eye hasn't seen. Do we use church tradition? No, nope. ear hasn't heard. Do we use intuition? Soul searching. No, nope. neither have have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. So how do we discover sound doctrine? But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit. 1 Corinthians 2.10 The Holy Spirit teaches us. For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. For what, no, what, for what man knoweth the things of a man save the Spirit of man which is in him? Even so the things of God knoweth no man but the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God, that we, may, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God, which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man, that's a lost man, in spite of all his degrees that he may have, the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. They are spiritually judged, evaluated. He cannot understand the things of God, because all he has in him, the natural man, is the spirit of man. The lost man, the natural man, can't understand the Bible. The Christian can understand the Bible because he or she has the indwelling Holy Spirit teaching. All secular education. If you could get, listen, I'll, I'll state it another way. If you could obtain, if it were possible, if you could obtain every diploma, every advanced degree possible on earth. You attended every school, every institution of learning. All of that put together is no substitute whatsoever for the Holy Ghost indwelling the believer and teaching the believer as the believer reads the scriptures. 1 Corinthians 2.15 but he that is spiritual judgeth all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. For who hath known the mind of the Lord, that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. And I won't read 1 Corinthians 3. You read it. I read enough. <laughs> have to move on in Luke 10. Luke 10. We'll get to it shortly. 1 Corinthians 3. The Apostle Paul, the Holy Spirit, through Paul, warns the Corinthians. The Corinthians, they're the worldliest Christians in Scripture. 
Oh, they're saints. They just don't act like it. They act like lost people. They think like lost people. That's, that's often the body of Christ today. Unfortunately, that's, what, that, that's the, the bitter reality of it. Paul warns them in 1 Corinthians 3, at the judgment seat of Christ. You Corinthians, because you are pushing aside true wisdom, the mystery program, and you're, you're praising the wisdom of this world and the Greek philosophers and the, the poets and the orators. Oh, look, at, look how wise we are. Yeah, in the world, by the world's standards, by God's standards, you're fools. And 1 Corinthians 3 tells them, you're accumulating wood, hay, and stubble, worthless building materials at the judgment seat of Christ. You have your denominational doctrine, you have your philosophy, your wisdom, your traditions of men, but you don't have God's wisdom. Would haste double. You should be accumulating gold, silver, precious stones. Spiritual wisdom, spiritual knowledge, spiritual understanding. You gain that through my ministry. Corinthians, Romans through Philemon. Paul would tell us the same thing today. Body of Christ. Jesus Christ. Through me, gave you 13 epistles. Romans through Philemon. And look at where you are today. Look at the mess you're in today. Would hey stubble. Denominations, sects, and cults. And we have our philosophers in Christendom. We have our speculators in Christendom. We have our peddlers of science, falsely so-called in Christendom. But do we have God's wisdom? <laughs> And that's why the body of Christ acts so silly in the world today. It's in the world. Carnal thinking, fleshly thinking. We haven't listened to God's wisdom through the Apostle Paul. We're not listening to Christ's heavenly ministry. We're going back to His earthly ministry. We're going to the law of Moses. We're not listening to the dispensation of grace. Not God's fault. Mm -mm. No, not God's fault at all. If we want to waste our time and energy, we can. Yeah. Look, the body of Christ has been doing that for 2,000 years anyway. Colossians 2.8. And then we'll have to move back to Luke 10. Beware, 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 beware. Oh, if we could put that on a neon sign. Flashing. Beware, beware, beware. I think most church members would turn away anyway. They wouldn't care to hear. Watch out! Lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. Satan wants to... He can't take our spiritual blessings in Christ away from us. They're permanent. But Satan can rob us of that knowledge. We're heirs of a million spiritual dollars. And Satan, his evil world system, corrupts our mind. Church tradition, philosophy, whatever. To cause us to believe we're spiritual paupers. You don't have anything in your bank account. <laughs> God says we do. But... If we're not walking by faith, we'll think we have zilch, nothing. Spoiled, robbed, robbed. So many Christians today, whether genuine Christians or just professing members of the body of Christ or simply members of the local church, all mixed up, all confused, but there's a lot of, quote, scholarship, the blind leading the blind. Okay, sad to say it. It's the blind leading the blind. We have too many unbelievers in our church leadership positions, school positions, or people who are thinking like lost people when they're really saved. They're really saved, but they're thinking like they're not saved. Thinking like the world, not thinking like God. And they're, they're perverting our denominational systems in our schools, our institutions, our Bible study groups, our Bible translations, 
and so on. Yeah, ooh. Going back to our prior lesson, I told you about the Alexandrian texts, the modern English versions, Greek manuscript family there, Vaticanus and Sinaiticus, the two chief representatives, Vaticanus and Sinaiticus, the two, quote, <laughs> oldest and best manuscripts used to challenge the King James Bible, the Novum Testamentum, Greci, Nesolan, the Nessel's Greek. Here is a Greek New Testament that English translators use today. It's in 28 editions. Over the last 100 years, modern English versions have relied on this. Nestles goes back to the late 1890s. Nestles. Or, and or, they've used the United Bible Society's Greek text. This is another Greek New Testament. This has been around since the 60s, mid-60s. This has four editions out. So the modern English versions, by the way, these are ecumenical books. Let me read to you something. Who sat on this committee of this United Bible Society's Greek text? There's a man named Carlo M. Martini. Carlo M. Martini. That's the UBS Greek. Look at the Nessos, Nessoland Greek. Eh, Carlo M. Martini. He's another editor. Carlo M. Martini was a Jesuit scholar, Roman Catholic. Hmm. Protestants use these Jesuit approved books to translate Protestant New Testaments into English. That's what I withheld from our previous lesson, I tell you that now. Oh, but before I forget, today in Christendom, these are lauded as scholarly. Here's the scholarly New Testament in Greek, if you want the scholarly Bible, the one closest to the original autographs. Here they are. <laughs> they don't even agree with themselves. Here, moving on, here is the Westcott Hort. 1885 edition, Greek New Testament there. Huh. That, that used to be scholarly until Nestles and the UBS took its place. Those are the scholarly New Testaments. You want to be a scholar? You have to follow them or you're a nobody. The scholars consider you, consider you an outcast if you don't follow them with their corrupt Greek New Testaments, as well as the Vaticanus and Sinaiticus also have corrupt Old Testaments. Moving on, here is a Stephanus 1550 Greek text, New Testament. This is one of the King James translators' sources. That is the preserved Greek New Testament. The Textus Receptus, it's also called Stephanus 1550, that edition. The Nestles, the UBS, Westcott and Hart, garbage, counterfeit. That's the wisdom of this world. The Textus Receptus, the King James Greek, that is the wisdom of God. Whatever version you use, my friend, you'll find that Alexandria is spoken of negatively. Try Acts 18. Alexandria, Egypt. Egypt is a type of the world. Why are we looking for God's word in Egypt? <laughs> Egypt in the Bible, in any Bible, is a type of the world. Even Vaticanus and Sinaiticus show us that Egypt is a type of the world. We shouldn't be looking for God's word in Egypt anyway. The disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. Acts 11, 26. So where should we look for the preserved New Testament? Try Antioch. Try the Textus Receptus, the TR, the received text, the King James Greek. Eh? That's faith. Eh? Doubt. Let's go look 
in Alexandria for the preserved word. <laughs> no, they don't even believe God preserved this word anyway. That's why they constantly reconstruct it with all their degrees and their revisions. New editions, modern versions go through so many editions. Pathetic. Moving on. Luke 10, 22. It's good in thy sight, Father. It seems good in thy sight to reveal the, these spiritual truths to believers, not lost people, people who submit to you, to me, teaching them. And if they want to know you, Father, they should get to know me. And if they want to know me, they should get to know you. My Father, verse 22, All things are delivered to me of my Father, and no man knoweth who the Son is but the Father, and who the Father is but the Son, and he to whom the Son will reveal him. There's that communion. You know the Father, then you'll know the Son. If you know the Son, then you'll know the Father. If you don't know the Son, you won't know the Father. If you won't know the Father, you won't know the Son. Luke 10, 23. And I just realized my map. It's not upright. It's all right. It's okay. We've set the land of Canaan aright. Okay. Now, that looks better. I was too busy, caught up in teaching. And I can clearly see ahead, as well as here, <laughs> that it was on its side all that time. Okay, I wasn't referring to the map anyway, so it doesn't matter. Hmm. Okay, Luke 10. Luke 10, 23. And he turned him unto his disciples and said privately, Blessed are the eyes which see the things that ye see. For I tell you that many prophets and kings have desired to see those things which ye see, and have not seen them, and to hear those things which ye hear, and have not heard them. That is reminiscent of Matthew 13. So come over to Matthew 13. The parables. Israel is blinded here because of the parables. They didn't want to believe, now they can't believe. John 12. Matthew 13, the parables. Mark 4, the parables. Luke 8, the parables. Israel has the wisdom of this world, but no wisdom of God now. Didn't want it, now they don't have it. Matthew 13, verse 14. And in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah, Isaiah 6, 9 and 10. Which saith, by hearing ye shall hear, they'll hear with physical ears, but they won't understand, shall not understand. Seeing ye shall see with physical eyes, and shall not perceive. For this people's heart is waxed gross, callous, hard-hearted. It's a heart problem. And their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes they have closed. They've closed their eyes. They don't, they don't want to see. Huh? What God, what do you want to show us? We don't see anything. Oh, now I see. Now we see. <laughs> Covering your eyes, huh, Israel? We can't hear. Uncover your ears. Now you can hear, huh? Didn't want to hear. That's lost people today. Lest at any time they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and should understand with their heart and should be converted and I should heal them. But blessed are your eyes for they see and your ears for they hear because you want to see. Little flock, you want to hear. Israel's believing remnant. For verily I say unto you that many prophets and righteous men have desired to see those things which ye see, and have not seen them, and to hear those things which ye hear, and have not heard them. See? In first Peter, first Peter, first Peter one, first Peter one, verse nine. Receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls, of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ, which was in them, did signify, when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. The Old Testament prophets, the kings, the preachers, 
they could read the Hebrew Bible and they could see to some extent Messiah was coming. Now, they, they didn't understand the timing. Okay? They didn't see how Messiah could come twice. They didn't see that. Okay? We see that now in hindsight. They couldn't see it. God didn't expect them to see it. He hid it from them. Isaiah 53, Psalm 22, there was a suffering Messiah. And there was a, a reigning Messiah. Psalm 2, Isaiah 11, Jeremiah 23, various passages. He reigns. They didn't see that there were two comings. One coming to die, another to reign. It's not one Messiah to die and then another to reign. It's one Messiah to die and the same Messiah coming back and reigning as king later. They also didn't see the 1 Corinthians 2 wisdom of God gap. 2,000 year dispensation of grace mystery program between the first and second comings. Now that I'm here, the Lord Jesus Christ speaks. Now that I'm here, you who hear me and see me, you are seeing and hearing the fulfillment of passages that the prophets who read them centuries and millennia back couldn't understand. Now you see. Now you understand. Now they don't see Paul's mystery yet. No. Paul will show them later in Acts 15 at the Jerusalem Bible Conference. The little flock will understand the prophetic program being delayed there. Pause as our mystery program operates. But here in, in Luke 10, to some degree, they're seeing much more. He's teaching them through the Hebrew Bible. He's teaching them so they have a greater understanding of their Hebrew Bible than their forefathers did, going all the way back to Job. And the first Bible book written, Job. Luke 10, 25. And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tempted him. He challenges him. I challenge him, saying, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said unto him, What is written in the law? How readest thou? And he answering said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy strength and with all thy mind and thy neighbor as thyself. And he said unto him, Thou hast answered right, this do and thou shalt live. Stop. Here we are. There's opposition. A certain lawyer he studies the law of Moses. I have a question. Master. Now he's not asking in faith. He's asking in unbelief. He's tempting Jesus. He's testing. Let's see if he answers. What does he answer? Like a, like a captious question. Let's see if he can answer it. The Lord replies. What is written in the law? Luke 10, 26. You're a lawyer, aren't you? You're supposed to be a law scholar, Mosaic scholar, a law teacher. What do you read in the law? How do you read it? The Lord didn't tell him anything other than, well, what do you read in the law? <laughs> he puts that lawyer on the spot there. You tell me. Okay? So, rather than Jesus being put in a bind, the lawyer is. Luke 10, 27. So the lawyer, he answers, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy strength, and with all thy mind, and thy neighbor as thyself. That's similar. It's not the same account. It is similar, though, to Matthew 19, 16 to 22, Mark 10, 17 to 22, and Luke 18, 18 to 23. 
is a, a rich young ruler. What must I do? Good master, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why callest thou me good? There's none good but one God. <laughs> so then the next time, that rich young ruler says, Master, <laughs> he dropped the word good. <laughs> we'll get to that in Luke 19. In Luke 10 here, a question is asked, a trick question. It's similar to a trick question that will be asked later during the Passion Week. Jesus' last week alive, when he's in the temple, he'll be asked a question. One of those law scholars will inquire of him about what's the greatest commandment. That'll be Matthew 22, 35 to 40, and Mark 12, 28 to 32. Luke doesn't have that. We've already covered that. That law teacher, he's knowledgeable. Hmm. One of the few who actually know the Hebrew Bible, leading Israel. But does he believe it in the heart? He knows it in the head. Does he believe it in the heart? Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy strength and with all thy mind and thy neighbor as thyself. Luke 10, 27. He knows that's what the Hebrew Bible says. Let's see if he believes it in the heart though. Deuteronomy 6, 5. Deuteronomy 6, 5. This is what that lawyer is quoting. Deuteronomy 6, 5. 6, 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy might. Leviticus 19 is the other one. Leviticus 19. Leviticus 19, 18. Thou shalt not avenge nor bear any grudge against the children of thy people, but thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. I am the Lord. I am the Lord. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love the Lord your God with everything that you have. All your heart, all your soul, all your strength, all your mind, entirely holy. First four commandments. The last six commandments, love your neighbor as yourself. Those are all ten commandments there. In addition to the 600 other rules and regulations in the Law of Moses, all of those rules can be summarized, and the Lord will say this, in Matthew 22 and Mark 12, love the Lord your God with all of your being and love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on those two. The first is love the Lord your God, first and greatest commandment. Second is love your neighbor as yourself. All the law is encapsulated in those two expressions. Israel's relationship with God and Israel's relationship, should I say, the Jews' relationship with other Jews. Israel's relationships internally. That's how you inherit eternal life. But can we do that? Can the flesh do it? No. Do we love God 100%? All our mind, all our might, all our soul, all our strength, all our heart? No. That's what sin is. Okay? If it's not complete, total, absolute perfection, God won't have it. That's what sin is. Okay? And it's not about how much do we love God. Our, our, our love is feeble and weak. Fickle. It's about God's love for us at Calvary. Okay? Now this is before Calvary. Okay? If you want to do something, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? All right. Well, what does the law say then? Okay? The law says measure up completely, totally, 100%. Sent perfection. Can't do it, huh? Now, see, that's what sin is. Now, watch what this man says. Luke 10, 28. 
The Lord answered him, Thou hast answered right. This do, and thou shalt live. Yeah, you have to do, though. Can you do? D-O? No. No. See? Sinners don't. It's not sinners do, it's sinners don't. The law. There's nothing wrong with the law. There's something wrong with us. The law points out our sin. It shows us we're sinners. It can't help us not sin. It can't help us stop being sinners. It can only point us to the Savior. You need a Savior. The law says, jump high enough. No, I can't. I'm a sinner. Okay, the Savior will bring you up to there. His righteousness. Now you're the righteousness of, of God in Christ. So watch this. The parable of the Good Samaritan. <laughs> Here we go. The parable of the Good Samaritan. Luke 10, verse 29. But he, willing to justify himself, said unto Jesus, And who is my neighbor? Who's my neighbor? Master. Who's my neighbor? I'm to love my neighbor as myself, huh? Well, I love myself a lot. But, if you're going to mention neighbors, who's my neighbor? Who should I love as much as I love myself? See, the sinner loves self, but can the sinner love others to the degree he loves self? <laughs> Watch. Luke 10, 29. He's willing to justify himself, clear himself. <laughs> this lawyer... He's guilty of a certain behavior and he's hoping that Christ Jesus will clear him of any guilt. <laughs> He'll be condemned. Won't be cleared at all. He'll be culpable. The lawyer. Well, let's keep reading. Luke 10, 30. And Jesus answering said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves which stripped him of his raiment and wounded him and departed, leaving him half dead. And by chance, there came down a certain priest that way. And when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. And likewise, a Levite, when he was at the place, came and looked on him and passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was. And when he saw him, he had compassion on him and went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine, and set him on his beast, and brought him to an inn, and took care of him. And on the morrow, when he departed, he took out two pence, and gave them to the host, and said unto him, Take care of him, and whatsoever thou spendest more, when I come again, I will repay thee. Which now of these three, thinkest thou, was neighbor unto him that fell among the thieves? The Lord puts the lawyer on the spot again. Who do you think? was neighbor to him that fell among the thieves. I won't tell you. You tell me. <laughs> and he said, verse 37, He that showed mercy on him, then said Jesus unto him, Go and do thou likewise. The parable of the Good Samaritan. Just about everybody, well, it used to be, who knows the Scriptures, has heard of the Good Samaritan. Even people who dislike the Bible, hmm, they quote it, and they don't know it. I don't believe the Bible. Separation of church and state. <laughs> and yet, there's something called the Good Samaritan Law. Did you know that came from the Bible? Oh, it can't be. Separation of church and state. Ignoramus. Ignoramus, we've taken the term from the Bible, but we don't like the Bible. <laughs> so the unbelievers, they hate the scriptures, and yet they quote it. Whenever the words of the Good Samaritan roll off their lips, they're quoting scripture. Hmm. The Good Samaritan. A certain man, Luke 10, 30. This is unique to Luke. Samaritans, outcasts, remember, at the close of Luke 9. Luke again, outcasts. He focuses on outcasts. There's a certain man, Luke 10, 30. He went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves. 
which stripped him of his raiment and wounded him and departed, leaving him half dead. And now that I need the map, I've removed it, haven't I? Back to putting it up again. And it's oriented properly. Hmm. Now that I need it, it's upright. I'm glad I corrected the error. <laughs> okay. Luke 10, 30. Luke 10, 30. A certain man, he's going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. He falls among thieves. Jerusalem. He's leaving Jerusalem and he's going to Jericho like this. Okay, here's Jerusalem. Here's Jericho. He goes this way. Okay. Jerusalem in the mountains. Jericho that's in the Jordan River Valley, lower elevation. In other words, there's an enormous escarpment, we could call it, a ramp, a natural slope. He's descending from Jerusalem to Jericho, right here, just north of the Dead Sea, northwest of the Dead Sea, west of the Jordan River, there's a man, a certain man, going from Jerusalem to Jericho. He falls among thieves. This is a steep, winding, rocky, lonely road. It was a major route of commerce. And thieves would lurk in the crevices and the caves on the mountainsides to rob merchants, passers-by. Okay? This is rooted in history. That road from Jerusalem to Jericho was dangerous. Christ will walk it just before the triumphal entry, Palm Sunday. He'll leave Jericho and go to Jerusalem. It's a 17-mile stretch overall from Jerusalem to Jericho winding like that, down. It's a 3,300 foot drop overall. A thousand meter drop over the course of 27 kilometers long. So it's steep. Okay? It's a winding road. 17 miles, 27 kilometers. Well, this unfortunate man he falls among thieves and they strip him of all that he has, his raiment, and they wound him. They take his clothes, they wound him, and they leave him half dead. He's dying. He's been brutally assaulted, attacked, and he's on the verge of death. Now watch this, verse 31, and by chance, ah! Oh, for some people, cardiac arrest is experienced there, a heart attack. By chance, there is no such thing as chance. God ordains everything. He's chosen what's to happen before the foundation of the world. Again, that reformed Calvinistic mindset. Jesus Christ, he thought there was such a thing as chance. The Calvinists don't like that, but it's what the Bible says, huh? Luke 10, 31, and by chance. There's no design here. God didn't manipulate circumstances. I want you to go, I want you to go, I want you to go. No. By chance, it just so happened to fall out like this. That's what Jesus Christ thought. By chance. It's not, and God chose a certain priest to pass by that way. <laughs> God, God isn't involved here. That's what Jesus thinks. By chance, 
the absence of design here by chance, Luke 10, 31. By chance there came down a certain priest that way. The priest, when he saw the man beaten and lying on the side of the road, oh, poor you, too bad, and keeps walking. He passed by on the other side. More than just he kept walking, he was on the side of the road as the man. Hmm. Let me get over here, switch lanes. I want nothing to do with him. The priest doesn't help, huh? He passes on the other side. 32, likewise a Levite of the tribe of Levi. When he was at the place, came and looked on him. Well, at least the Levite, he gave him a little more sympathy there. Oh, yeah. You're pretty bad off, aren't you? I can't help either. He passed by on the other side. So the priest didn't help. The Levite didn't help. Ah, oh, verse 33. But a certain Samaritan. Ah! A certain Samaritan. As he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. No. Oh. Oh, 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 right here. This is offensive to Jesus' Jewish audience. Outrageous! The Samaritan, as he journeyed, he came where he was, Luke 10, 33, and when he saw him, he had compassion on him. The Samaritan, oh, Remember our closing comments of Luke 9. The Jews and the Samaritans passionately hate each other. The Samaritans are half Jews, half Gentile. They're considered Gentile by reason of their ancestors being intermarried Jews and Assyrians, Gentiles and other nations. The Samaritans were not full-blooded Jews. The Jews, the full-blooded Jews, despised the Samaritans. Now, to hear the hero of a story here being a Samaritan, oh, and not a Jew. The priest, he wasn't the hero. He was a Jew. No, no hero to me, the Lord says. He's, he was no hero. The Levite, he's a Jew. He's no hero there. Who's the hero? The Samaritan is the hero. Uh, the Samaritan had compassion when the Jew didn't. Hadn't had compassion. Luke 10, 34. The good Samaritan. The person who helps one in need. And that term is used even today in modern English. The Good Samaritan. Thank you, Holy Bible. Hmm. The Good Samaritan. Luke 10, 34. The Samaritan went to the one lying on the side there, half dead, and bound up his wounds. Can't you just picture the lawyer there to whom Jesus is speaking? Any full-blooded Jews present? Well, they're just squirming. Ooh, he's praising a Samaritan. <clears throat> Jesus is praising a Gentile? Hmm. Their blood is just boiling over. The Samaritan went to him and bound up his wounds and pouring in oil and wine and set him on his own beast and brought him to an inn and took care of him. Oh, it just gets worse and worse. That Samaritan does better and better, huh? The Samaritan, unlike the priest, unlike the Levite, the Samaritan 
had compassion on the abused man. He bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine. He set him on his own beast. He brought him to an inn and he took care of him. Oh, that's what the Jew didn't do. Verse 35, and on the morrow, when he departed, he took out two pence. That's something else that Jew hadn't done, huh? Those Jews, the priest, the Levite, they didn't do that either. He took out two pence and gave them to the host. And said unto him, Take care of him, and whatsoever thou spendest more, when I come again, I will repay thee. Yeah. Okay, end the story. Okay, so Christ asks the lawyer now, Which now of these three thinkest thou was neighbor unto him that fell among the thieves? Lawyer. Who was behaving? like a neighbor to that man who was half dead because of the thieves. Now, watch closely. Watch how the lawyer replies. Luke 10, 37, and he said, the Samaritan. <laughs> the lawyer can't even bring himself to say that title, Samaritan. He's distancing himself from that confession. I won't say Samaritan. Mm -mm. Nope. <laughs> Luke 10, 37. He carefully answers, He that showed mercy on him. Luke 10, 37. Oh, so the Lord says, You mean the Samaritan? <laughs> the lawyer didn't want to say that. But that's really what he should have said. Make that confession. It's the Samaritan, huh? Yes, it is. Instead, the lawyer responded, He that showed mercy on him. Who showed mercy on him? The Samaritan showed mercy. Yeah. The priest, a certain priest, what an inconvenience. Can't help him. The Levite passing by? Inconvenience. I can't help him. They just keep going on their way. Priest can't help him. Levite can't help him. The Good Samaritan helps him. Do you know what's being pictured here? There's, there's symbolism. There's symbolism. Now, if you want to be shallow minded, the Sunday School for Children lesson. Jesus wants us to be kind to others. Okay. That's good. That's good. Okay. But that's a kindergarten answer. Let's see if we can amplify that with mature spiritual reasoning. Is there something greater being taught here? Yes, there is. It's simply amazing. There was a time when religion robbed me. My denominational doctrine spoiled me, Colossians 2.8. Took knowledge from me, kept knowledge from me that I could have had through the Word of God rightly divided. My denomination kept that from me. I'm quite certain your group, your sect, your cult, your religion any religion of the world has kept Bible truth from you. I'm glad you've joined us. I hope you're listening with an ear to hear and you're watching and reading with an eye to see and you have a heart to believe. Here is what religion hid from me and what it's hid from so many millions of others concerning the parable of the Good Samaritan. The priest passing by, Luke 10, 31, the priest passing by, the priest, he's the mediator, 
according to the law of Moses, isn't he? He offers the sacrifices. There's the man on the side of the road. He's half dead. He's in the process of dying. The priest, he can tell him, you need to offer a sacrifice. Can the dying man offer a sacrifice, though? Can he offer a, a, an animal sacrifice? No! He's dying! Thank you. Sanctified common sense. Let me tell you. The man going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, drifting from God's presence to the world, to the curse, curse of Jericho. Jerusalem, the city of the great king, the word of the Lord is to proceed from Jerusalem, God's capital city and the earth. It will be one day. Yep. Israel wanders away from God's word, from his truth, from the, the Hebrew Bible. Goes off toward the world, the curse, and guess what? Sin and the world system, the evil world system, rob Israel, spoil Israel takes her raiment, wounds her. She loses sight of God's righteousness. She goes about to establish her own. She's naked. She has nothing on, like Adam and Eve, like the man living among tombs, wearing nothing. In Luke 8, remember that? Here is Israel, no clothes, on the side of the road, dead. In the, on the verge of death. The evil world system has abused her. Satan could not have done a better job. His evil world system has defiled Israel, destroyed Israel, but not quite. Not permanently. It looks bad. It looks bad. But wait. Let God intervene here. There's hope with Him. Verse 32, Luke 10, 32. Likewise, a Levite comes. The Levite, he teaches the law. He's of the tribe of Levi. The Levites were the copyists of the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament Scripture. The Levites, God had entrusted the manuscripts of Job and Moses and so on to them. The Levites were to take care of the Bible canon in the centuries before Christ. The tribe of Levi, they were the Bible copyists, they were the Bible teachers. The Levite passes by Israel. So the priest came by Israel can't help you. Can't offer a sacrifice. You're dying. The Levite. The Levite can teach Israel what the law demands. But can Israel perform? No. She's dying on the side of the road. Half dead. Hmm. The dying man can't offer any sacrifice. Dying man can do zilch. Not a nothing. Zippo except die on the side of the road. Helpless and hopeless. Priest can't help. Levi can't help. Luke 10, 33. But, praise the Lord, contrary to him not getting help from the priest or the Levite, there's a certain Samaritan. Ooh, a Samaritan. As he's journeying, the Samaritan has compassion. I feel sorry for you. Poor fellow on the side of the road, beaten, robbed, left to die. I have sympathy. Luke 10, 34, and went to him and bound up his wounds, and bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine, Oil and wine, antiseptic wine, 
oil to soothe and to heal medicine, and set him on his own beast, and brought him to an inn, and took care of him. And on the morrow, when he departed, he took out two pence, two days' wages there, and gave them to Denari, and gave them to the host, and said unto him, Take care of him, and whatsoever thou spendest more, when I come again, I will repay thee. Do you know what that is all about? Hmm. That Samaritan pictures Jesus Christ and what he will do for Israel. I will take care of your problems, Israel. I'll pour in oil and wine. I'll give you the Holy Spirit. I'll give you joy. I'll bind up your wounds. I'll take care of you. I'll bring you to an inn and take care of you there. On the morrow I leave. I take out two pits. You can stay for two months in this inn. I give them to the host. You take care of him and whatsoever thou spendest more. When I come again I will repay thee. That's Christ Jesus entrusting the nation Israel to the apostles, the little flock. You take care of them. I'm going away. I'm coming back though. I'm coming back. Israel is entrusted to the little flock. In John, in John 19, verse 26, Jesus tells his mother while he's hanging on the cross, Woman, behold thy son. And he points to the disciple whom he loved. That's John. And he tells John, John 19, 27, Behold thy mother. Now, now listen. Okay, no denominational eyeglasses here. This isn't Mary is the mother of the church and Mary is our mother. Mm -mm. No, 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 no. See, Mary pictures John's mother. Who is John's mother? It's Israel. It's the nation Israel. John, an apostle, I'm dying on the cross, Jesus declares. I'm leaving you, Israel, with the apostles. The apostles have the doctrine. And I want them to teach you while I'm away. My apostles will have the indwelling Holy Spirit. They will teach you, Israel, while I'm away. I'm off. I'm dying. I will soon be buried, be resurrected, and ascend into heaven. Go to my Father's right hand. I'll come back one day. When I come back, I will reward you, little flock. Matthew 16, 27. Matthew 16, 27, watch. Matthew 16, 27, For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of His Father with His angels, and then He shall reward every man according to His works. And Revelation, Revelation 22, Revelation 22, verse 12, And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me, to give every man according as his work shall be. Back to Luke. Back to Luke, Luke 10, 35. You take care of Israel, little flock. You take care of Israel, my twelve apostles. Whatsoever thou spendest, more. When I come again, I will repay thee. I will pay you back when I come again. Second coming. Luke 10, 35, the second coming. The second coming. Luke 19, 12 to 27, the parable of the talents. Christ leaves Israel, the little flock, should I say, with doctrine to believe the gospel of the kingdom and so on. The apostles, the little flock, there to teach unbelieving Israel how to come to faith in Christ. Luke 10, 36, which now of these three thinkest thou was neighbor unto him that fell among the thieves? was the Samaritan. And he said, He that showed mercy. Then said Jesus unto him, Go and do thou likewise. Go do what the Samaritan did. Oh. <laughs> and what happened to the lawyer, I don't know. But I do know that the lawyer was quite uncomfortable in hearing the Samaritan 
was the good guy in the parable there, not the priest and not the Levite. A certain priest passed by. Oh, yes, he'll help him. Oh, Jesus said, no, he didn't help him. Oh, look, it's a Levite. Yeah, he'll help him. No, Jesus says, not him either. <laughs> it's the Samaritan. The Samaritan helped. Okay. Luke 10, 38. Luke focusing on women. And here, exclusive to Luke, two women. Luke 10, 38. Now it came to pass as they went, and this is Bethany. Bethany. Little village of Bethany, near Jerusalem. Just a, a few miles east of the Jerusalem temple. Christ will begin the triumphal entry, or should I say Palm Sunday entry, in Bethany there. Bethany. He entered into a certain village and a certain woman named Martha received him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary, Luke 10, 39, which also sat at the feet, which also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. But Martha was cumbered about much serving and came to him and said, Lord, dost thou not care that my sister hath left me to serve alone? Bid her therefore that she help me. And Jesus answered and said unto her, Martha, Martha, thou art careful and troubled about many things, but one thing is needful, and Mary hath chosen that good part, which shall not be taken away from her. And that's the end of Luke 10. Commentary. <laughs> that's not the end of this study. Hold on. Martha and Mary. Martha and Mary, they're Lazarus' sisters. Look at... John 11, John 12. This certain village is Bethany. And we have two women, Martha and Mary, sisters. Martha receives Jesus into her house. She has a sister, Mary. Now Mary is sitting at Jesus' feet. And, he, and as he's teaching, Mary sits and listens like a disciple sitting as the rabbi teaches. Yes, I'm submissive. What do you have to teach me? That's Mary sitting there. Now what's Martha doing? Is Martha sitting with her sister and listening to the Savior? No. Luke 10, 40. But contrary to Mary <laughs> sitting and listening to Jesus teach, Martha is cumbered about much serving. And she actually comes to him and said, Lord, dost thou not care that my sister hath left me to serve alone? Oh, she's worried about all sorts of things, isn't she? She's distracted. Martha, her mind, is sidetracked. Mary is listening to the Savior. Martha She's looking all around her. She's fumbling with pots and pans and cups, napkins, <laughs> forks, spoons. I know that's contemporary there. Martha isn't paying attention to what matters. She thinks what she's doing matters. Lord, why don't you make Mary get up and help me? She's busy listening to you. She needs to help me. Tell her to come help me. Jesus answered and said unto her, Martha, Martha, thou art careful and troubled about many things. Careful. You're full of care. You're worried. You're stressed out. You're worked up. And you're troubled about many things. Luke 10, 42, but one thing is needful. <laughs> I'm sorry, I have to stop here. Commentators refer to this, but one thing is needful as, Martha, you just need one dish, not a bunch. <laughs> you, need, you simply need to prepare one meal, not a bunch. <laughs> I think that's rather silly, that. The idea here is not, Martha, prepare one dish, not many. It's, one thing is needful, Martha, and Mary knows what it is, and you don't. 
One thing is needful, Luke 10, 42, and Mary hath chosen that good part. Mary knows what the one needful thing is. What is it? Mary hath chosen that good part, verse 42, which shall not be taken, which shall not be taken away from her. Mary, sinner there, means sinner, that's converted Israel, the little flock listening to the Messiah speak and teach. Martha, mistress, as in head, like female master there, mistress. She's hospitable, but she's distracted. That's Israel, lost in works religion. Unbelieving Israel is too busy focusing on what they do in the law instead of listening to the Savior. Like Mary is listening to the Savior. Martha is fumbling around when she should be sitting and listening to the Lord. Speak His Word. Martha, Martha, thou art careful and troubled about many things. If you come over to, here's a good cross reference. Philippians. 4, Philippians 4, 6 and 7. Almost out of time. So let me get to Philippians 4 quickly. Philippians 4, verse 6. Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known unto God and the peace of God. Martha didn't have any peace, did she? She's fretting, anxious, hyper-vigilant, worried about everything but what really matters. We can find ourselves in the same predicament today if we listen too much to the world and not enough of the Word, rightly divided. How sad it is we have believers the world over, believers in Christ, they're on their way to heaven. And yet they're thinking like they're on their way to hell. They're not thinking like God's people. They don't know the word of God rightly divided. They don't know about grace. They don't know about grace living. They know about legalism and law and, and Moses and Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. They know about church tradition. Patristic writings, the church fathers. Anything and everything but the truth. And, and, and they're like this, looking all over. They should be like Mary, sitting and listening to the Lord speak through the Apostle Paul, Romans through Philemon. All these circumstances around us distract us. Romans 8, Satan will use our situations, our circumstances, to sidetrack us. Hey, look over here. And as long as we focus on that, then we aren't watching the Lord. We aren't listening to the Lord. And we're like Peter, walking on the water. Lord, can I come out and walk to you? Yes, Peter, come on. Peter walks. Oh, he sees the wind boisterous. Oh, I, I won't make it. I'll sink. Down he goes, huh? walking on the water. Now he's going under the water. He took his eyes off the Lord and he looked at his circumstances. That's Martha. Hmm. That's apostate Israel. Sidetracked, not thinking properly. Caught up in the wisdom of this world. 1 Corinthians 1, 2, and 3. The Corinthians, distracted, don't have the knowledge of God. Martha, Martha, thou art careful. Luke 10, 41. Careful? That's also translated in Matthew 6 and Luke 12 as taking thought, worrying. The little flock worrying about their material needs. No, you don't worry about your material needs. You seek my righteousness. The kingdom of God and His righteousness first. And all these things will be added to you. Little flock. Don't be careful. Don't be troubled. Full of care. Worry. Fretting. One thing is needful. 
it's my word to Israel. That is what's needful. Mary has chosen my word, which shall not be taken away from her. No matter what, my word will stand forever. Get your priorities in order, Martha, like your sister Mary. Don't be distracted. You'll lose all your possessions, Israel, especially, especially in Daniel's 70th week, but you won't lose my word. The stuff Martha's spreading over, that's temporary. Mary's listening to my Father's word, my word, that's eternal. That's eternal. And that's enough. That's sufficient. Heavenly Father, thank you for Luke chapter 10. And now, chapter 11. Thank you for your word, rightly divided, dispensationally delivered, considered, and believed in the heart. Thank you for Christ dying for our sins. Thank you for him being buried. Thank you for him being raised again. That we would trust him and him alone. And just as that shed blood gives us a right standing before you, so it will redeem Israel and give her a right standing before you too. Then the ages to come, in the dispensation of the fullness of times, you will gather together in one all things in Christ, whether in heaven, through the body of Christ, or in earth, redeemed Israel. Thank you for that opportunity in Christ's name. Amen. And now Luke 11.